just gonna wait for it to go live here. Awesome, it looks like that we're live. All right, everyone. Hello, welcome back. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're watching from. My name is Jake Sussman. And for those of you who don't know, I'm a dyslexic and ADHD change maker and entrepreneur and founder of Superpower Consulting, a mentorship organization that works with kids around the world and connects them to their very own advocate. Now, since quarantine started about a year ago, a little bit over a year ago, I have been interviewing many different people from parents to industry leaders, to doctors, to business leaders, and also people like you and I. Now we all have at least one thing in common though, and that's that we have learning and attention challenges and school came challenging. We've overcome this adversity. Now tonight, I have a good friend of mine joining us. His name's Lederic. Now diagnosed with a learning disability in the third grade, Lederic Horn defies any and all labels. He's a dynamic spoken word poet, which I'm excited to hopefully hear some of your work, a tireless advocate for all people with disabilities, an inspiring motivational speaker, a bridge builder between learners and leaders across the US and around the world who serves as a role model for all races, genders, and generations. Now, Lederic is the grandson of one of New Jersey's most prominent civil rights leaders. But Derek uses his gift for spoken word poetry as the gateway to larger discussions on equal opportunity, pride, self-determination, and hope for people with disabilities. Wow. His workshops, keynote speeches, and performances reach thousands of students, teachers, legislators, policymakers, business leaders, and service providers each year. He regularly addresses an array of academic government, social, and business groups, including appearances at what? The White House? Wow, I'm excited to hear about that. The United Nations, Harvard, Mercedes-Benz Fashion Week. Okay, okay. The National Association of State Directors of Special Education and the State Departments of Education across the U.S. Woo! His work addresses the challenges of all disabilities, uniting the efforts of diverse groups in order to achieve substantive Systematic, systemic change. Woo! That's that's serious. I I don't know, Lederic, if, if if anyone can top that. That's I don't I, I don't know. That was some impressive reading out loud as a as a fellow dyslexic. I don't know if I'd read the whole bio. So I'm I'm impressed. <laughs> I'm impressed yeah, I, with I, that. I will be honest. I did practice this for an hour. No, I'm, I'm okay. Because <laughs> that's what it would have taken for me to read my own bio out loud. Oh my goodness! In front of everyone. Yeah. Well. Welcome. I'm I'm so happy that you're joining us. And for those of you who are just tuning in, um, I encourage you to please let me know where you're watching from. Um, if you have questions, uh, please feel free to ask. There's about a 15 second delay here. Uh, we also have a surprise guest who I'm just going to let him hop on when he comes on. Um, but he's a great guy. So um, yeah, and again, really community, this is all about community and sharing. So if you have a question or if you have a thought or if you're triggered by something, most likely other people are. So I really encourage you to share. This is a safe space and we're really all in this together, okay? So with that being said, Derek, welcome to the show. No, thanks for having um, me. So you've really been, you have quite the resume. You have quite the resume. And I, I remember when I first got involved in this space, I've, I've heard of you and you've actually been someone and I, I, that I, I really admire um, going back to when I was in high school because I, I used to work for a, a guy named Harvey Hubble who is in, he's an Emmy Award film producer, really involved in the dyslexic space. And part of my job was to research influencers to help promote his movie and you were on the list so i was like oh the derek Horn, I, I know this guy okay Ar Ar um, good guy. great guy so tell me how why did you get in this space well i i come into this work um as uh as someone who has lived the experience of you know having challenges around learning and uh passing through a uh, school system that um, in some pay ways were very supportive but in others did not give me what I needed to be successful. Um, and 
I, unlike so many of my peers, was able to not only graduate from high school, but then go on to college and, um, and then want to tell, you know, my story, my experience to the rest of the world and try to make the world a better place for, for the, you know, the generations coming up and those, those yet to be. Yeah, I mean, it's to have that determination to make this your profession. I mean, your job is to inspire the next generation. That's, that's pretty awesome. That's, that's all that, that when, when I say that, what do you like, how does that sit with you? Uh, that's too big of a job. <laughs> that's, 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 that's a big job. I, you know, I, I, um, I do think it's my, uh, it, you know, I've taken on the responsibility of trying to make the world a better place. And I think that's something that so many of us do in our own, in our own way. Um, but I also know that, um, what needs to be done can only be done through collaboration. And so, um, you know, it's always great to be able to work with, um, you know, energized and, and passionate state leaders, you know, at different departments of ed, um, with local school leaders, with different activists, with artists, you know, when we're all pulling the rope, you know, in the same direction, um, that's how things move. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, oh gosh, it's, to have this kind of drive, it, it, it's it, it's it's amazing. Now, how many schools have you have you spoken at in, in, in your career? I should probably know that tally, but I but I don't. Um, I'm not I'm not sure. I know that throughout the course of the year, it's anywhere from thirty five to fifty five or sixty presentations. I think with this past year in Zoom, it feels like I'm on one of these sort of having one of these conversations or uh, you know yeah. doing a workshop or something like that. Like almost every other day. Um, wow. And it's been an interesting space. Um, last week, I had a day where I started out um, started out talking to a group in uh, Austin, Texas. And then like in an hour later, I was um, working with a group for about an hour in Ohio, you know, and that's like a commute I could never have done uh, prior to, uh, you know, to us really leaning into all the tech. So. Right, right, right. Now, I, I want to know, so you're, you're a poet mm -hmm. and like, what do you talk about? Cause I, I, I know your work, but yeah. how long, how long have you been writing for? Um, I do, you do poetry slams. What do you write about? And if you're, if you're open for it, I'd love, I'd love to hear some, if you, if you have any, if you have anything off the cuff. Yeah. So I, um, I started writing, I guess maybe kind of playing around, you know, not really being serious, but um, I, I traveled in a circle of incredible artists when I was in high school, um, all wordsmiths, MCs, um, a lot of them really just encouraged me to try to, you know, perform and, and rap and that kind of stuff, but I just, I couldn't do it. Um, but I got to college and um, my college experience for me was uh, very transformative. Um, it was the first time I really started connecting with people, you know, who, uh, who had similar uh, learning experiences, my own um, first time that I started using accommodations and through all of that, the counselors who were a part of the um, support program that I, I took part in in college just said, you know, my counselor just said, just write, you know, just go for it. And, um, and I just began waking up and writing poetry and um, and then, you know, I got kind of like a collection of poems together and I went back to her and I was like, all right, what do I do now? And um, she helped me find my first open mic. And that was, that was a really great experience. Um, I, you know, I remember building this community of mentors and friends on campus. And, you know, we went downtown and, you know, I got called up on stage and I do my thing and everybody claps, you know, and like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say any of those poems now. Um, but it was, it was a shot in the arm, you know, it like gave me a lot of confidence. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, and, and, you know, and I think initially, and maybe even, you know, today, there, there's still a lot of just sort of exploration of identity within my work. Um, you know, um, uh, I was influenced at a real young age by um, artists who were also 
social activists, revolutionaries, folks like that. And so for me, like the arts have always served, um, served a need to help sort of point a finger at where, where, where the problems are, um, but then also helping us to imagine uh, what the world could be. And so, um, yeah, you know, I, I never really did, I never did slams. Um, I, you know, I poetry contests, stuff like that, but not a, not a legit slam, not really. I think maybe one or two my entire time sort of coming up. And I was writing poetry as like slam, slamming was like really becoming a thing. Slam though, this is for you. I feel like, you know, I, I relate because I also write a little bit and it's an, ex, it's an outlet. It, it's a way to express. And the, I, I want to highlight this and I want you to highlight if you can explore this too with us. And for those of you watching, this is something that I, I really, I really advocate for this is helping our kids identify their outlets, right? Because Lederick, you had an outlet and I want to explore what that moment was for you when you were like, when that teacher, when, when you're, when that mentor of yours was like, just start writing. But when we're in our lows, when we are in our moments of loss of power and for a lot of our kids and you're in our work for advocacy for kids with disability and those with disabilities, I mean, when we are being misunderstood, we need that thing to fall back on to give us that confidence, yeah. right? And I, I, I love that 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 you, yours was poetry because there is so much power in in in, in word, and, and when you have the words to put to your emotion, that's not only emotional intelligence, but it, it's art. And people hear it and they feel it, and it's it's and I've heard your work; it's really amazing. Yeah, and it's it's shifted over the years. Like you know, when I was a when I was a really little kid, I was always drawn to language, but as far as expression, it was it was the visual arts. You know, I could I could draw draw and and, um, and paint and sculpt and all that sort of stuff. Um, but more 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 than anything, I was a draftsman. And and um, although I didn't really realize it, I was using art as therapy. Right, so. I, I recently went back and dug through a bunch of my old drawings and, you know, you could see, you know, from where I was dating the work, where I was emotionally, you know, like mm. I was dealing with a lot of challenges around, the, you know, the, the difficulties I was having in school and how I felt about myself and the lowest self-esteem and just all this stuff. It was showing up on the page, you know, in my artwork. Um, and um, yeah, and, and it's, it, it's it's always sort of been there, right? Like I, I got a degree in math, you know, um, graduated and, and got a BA in math, but I minored in fine art. Um, and the entire time I was writing um, and, and, you know, and in addition to writing like storytelling, you know, and like figuring out how to connect with people and the, and the craft and narrative and all those sort of things. Um, but I, I agree with you. Um, you know, I was, I was an athlete in high school as well, you know, and I still, still run, still work out. Um, you know, uh, for some of us, it's, it's athletics, um, for, for others, you know, maybe it's some form of the arts, um, you know, it, you know, that I know plenty of folks with different, you know, different kind of labels who lean in very heavy in different academic areas. And that's where they find a lot of support for some of us. It's just, you know, knowing how to be a really good friend to people. Right. But I, I, I agree with you. Like, um, I think it is part of the role of all the educators and certainly the parents is to help our young people to be able to see and celebrate them for the places where they're really excellent. Mm, that's, that's like poetry right there. That's, <laughs> that's awesome. Um, do you have anything that you'd like to share with us? Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, um, on the spot, if that's okay with you. I mean, like, I know that we got some people that are excited to hear some of your work. How many people do we, can you see how many people? Are yeah, watching? so right, we've been averaging about probably around 15 or so right now, but who knows, people are coming in, people coming out, people are sharing this thing. So what, what do you guys think? I want to give a little shout out to Lederick because it's, this is, this is great. So let's, <laughs> let's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear it, man. So um, uh, I, I've been writing uh, pretty steadily throughout the, the past 12 months or so. Um, so let me, let me try this. Let's see if I can do this one. So this is, this is something that I wrote last year, um, uh, as part of us celebrating the 30th anniversary of the Americans with disability act. Um, 
And I actually debuted it at the, uh, the uh, Smithsonian Center's uh, Folk Life Festival. Um, and and, and um, then me and my boy, Justin Wu, shout out to Justin Wu. Um, we went down um, to DC, uh, uh, him and I, my, my fiance, and we filmed the video to go with it. So this, this poem is uh, Until Every Barrier Falls. And ho hopefully I can do this because I didn't practice this before. So let's see, <laughs> let's see, let's see if I can do it. This is for the ones who would not be trapped behind exclusion's shameful wall. And this is for the ones who will continue to push until every barrier falls. This is for every wounded warrior who came home and challenged our grateful nation to elevate its expectations. This is for the ones who blocked the buses, sat in the sit-ins and crawled to the Capitol. This is for the marchers, the protesters, those adapt angels with wheelchair wings who troubled the waters of their time so that this generation might live in a more inclusive now. As I write this, all over America, monuments are falling and only questions stand atop each empty pedestal. As I recite this, I hope an artist is listening and will respond with marble and bronze, but until then, Ed Roberts, Judy Human. This poem is for you. Let each line chase the light in your smiles and trace the contours of your commitments. Mm. Let these words salute those dedicated to the ideals that equality sprouts from the branch of equity. Independence is the flower that grows from access and freedom is rooted in advocacy. This is for the ones who have embraced the reality that humanity is both fragile and mighty. And when we ask for help, it is not a sign of weakness, but instead is an indication of our determination. However you navigate, it is legit. This is for those who read with their eyes, ears, and fingertips. This is for the minds that dance in details. And for the wide-eyed ones who remake the world with every thought they think, we are the river of innovation from which the whole world drinks. And who am I? I am a lover of words left heartbroken by every spelling test in school. My desk was in a classroom at the end of the hall. So this poem is for me too. Within me is the meeting of two movements. I am black and blue. My disability is hidden and I am the descendant of those who could not hide. I am your neighbor, your countryman, one of the poets our nation has produced. And here is what I know to be true, this world is not enough. And if this here is what we call normal, I say, let's be different. Let us at this time on this day, celebrate every shape, every color, every way. Let our actions commemorate the array of our being. Build a future in service of the multitude and let this century be the wilderness from which our better selves are born. There it is. Woo. Wow. I have, the, I have the chills right now. I don't know if any of you watching this have the chills, but you can see them. They're there. There they are. <laughs> they are there. They are. Oh my goodness. I don't have words because you said all the words. And okay. uh, it's just, what I took away from that not only did I feel connected to your story and to a, an, an inequity that is so true in our country, but what happens when one is given a voice? What happens when one finds the words yeah. and how those inequities become what you were able to take that to the next level? you know, because you are now able to talk on behalf. And the more we can get to talk on behalf, then we can rise up together. Yeah. Rise yeah. Up. Yeah. And I, you know, and I also, I also think that, um, you know, that, that so much of, you know, I think it's part of what, you know, the work that you're doing and um, the work that so many of us is doing is, you know, is, is helping our young people to, to find their own, voice right like they've always had it we all have it right like it's 
But I know for me, you know, some of the ordering that I use recently is like, I, I kind of need permission, right? Like, and sometimes I have to give myself permission yeah. to say what I want to say, right? Like life and society and so much of our culture oftentimes will make you feel as if like you, you can't say what's on your mind. You can't express what you're feeling that your experience is not valid. Um, and so what is wonderful is when, uh, you know, like for many of us, when we're younger, we need someone to just say, no, no, go ahead. Right. Like for me, it was someone that just said, don't worry about spelling. Right. Okay. No, you can't spell. So what? Just, just go write. Right. It's like, oh yeah, I could do that. Yeah, that's right. Like writing's not that big of a, uh, spelling's not that big of a deal. Right. Like it's what I actually say. That's most important. We can deal with the spelling later. Um, and, and even as far as uh, political expression, I think so many of us you know, and if we're fortunate, we get it from our parents or we get it from a mentor or maybe we, you know, pick up the right book at the right time in our lives and someone says, you know, what you're experiencing, what you're going through. Yeah, that's that's OK. Right. That's all right. And, you know, the way you feel about that. Yeah, that's OK, too. And OK, you want to do something about it? All right, let's go. Yeah. yeah. You know, I. It, it's such truth because. I feel like that we, as a society, we're so focused on fixing mm -hmm. and finding the solution. When in reality, those relationships, the people that see you for you, not just based off the color of your skin or based off the disability that you have, but see you for you and what you're capable of. Yeah. Well, not just that though, but like when someone, I believe someone can really see you like, this person also perhaps has experienced what you what you've either are oh, going oh, through. Now. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. You know? and, and to find that person that that can really say, you know what, I don't just get you, but I've been there. I know your pain. I feel your pain. Mm -hmm. And I, it, it's a new conversation. I, I I think really needs to be had. Because when it comes to mental health in our country, when it comes to helping to 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 fight the the inequality in our in our country, especially as it relates to education and special education, access to resources, right? Yeah. To uh, to, to find those who are relatable in all fronts, I I, I think is is super key. And that's exactly what you're saying here. Yeah, and then it also requires all of us. Like the, the other side of that is the to to for all of us to be vulnerable. Right. Yeah. To be willing to be to be vulnerable and to open up. You know, I, um, you know, I was I, was, I, I frequently will tell the story about the impact that, you know, I am here because I had I was born to two amazing parents right. and I have an, an amazing extended family and just a circle of support. I, li I still live in the in the same neighborhood I grew up in. I still live on the same block. Um, and um you know, my, my, when I was going through my, my toughest time when I was a teenager and I was facing high school graduation and didn't know where I was going to go, you know, like it was, I kind of said I was going to go to, to college and it was a bit of a, a leap and a prayer. And I was fortunate that my, my IEP team um, helped me find a local county college that had an amazing support program. And that was sort of the, 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 um, the ramp you know, that I used uh, to get into higher education. Um, but uh, when I was going through this really challenging time, the, um, you know, one of the things that really helped me is my mother just started opening up about the challenges she had had in school, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, and there, of course, wasn't a special education then, but she was like, yeah, you know, like, they, they probably would have put me in it, you know, if they had had one. And, you know, it's some of the advice that I give to parents is um, that one of the more powerful things they can give to their kids is to be honest about any challenges that they've had yes. in school. Um, and then more generally in life, you know, um, you know, my grandfather, you, you, you mentioned, uh, was a civil rights activist. He, he also, um, uh, him and my uncle ran a construction company. I live in one of the houses that my, my family built for a cousin of mine and I purchased it from him. Um, and uh, he was a tough guy, right? Like very resilient, living through very challenging times, you know, trying to change the world. And, 
if I had just listened to every hero story of him, you know, conquering over the odds, um, I mean, there's value in that and there's a lot you can pull from there, but some of the more powerful things that I know and I reflect on is when he um, softened a bit and talked about when, you know, he felt like he couldn't get to the next level, right? right. When he couldn't deal with it, you know, when there was adversity in front of him and he didn't know what to do and how did he deal with those situations? Right. And so, you know, whether it be for, for parents or, or educators, I think one of the more powerful things that we can, that we can do, and I think we owe it to all of us, is just to be human, you know, and to, to share the totality of, 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 of our humanity. And part of that means our failures and, you know, and, and telling the story of, of being knocked down and how you got back up. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I think what you just said, too, is a perfect segue into the next part of this conversation, because I actually have our special guest. He's waiting. Um, he's uh, a great friend um, of mine. And I know Lederick and him, uh, Jared, uh, ran a marathon two years ago at the IDA conference in Oregon. Um, and in, in the lobby, in the trainers. lobby, like unbelievable um and you know that to to overcome obstacles i mean here you have someone you know those obstacles are are relative right because there's all different types of obstacles that we face right but you know when you have to like run up that big hill that's holding you back and there's you just got to keep pushing well you know jared ran around the world seven days seven continents seven marathons and i'm sure he probably challenged a lot of hills um, but the cool thing too, is that speaking of mentor, he's also a mentor, uh, superpower consulting He's working with these kids and, you know, I'm excited for him to start to share a little bit about that experience. But, um, I, I just think it's important that we have this, this is just like a really going to be fun conversation. I'm actually going to bring him on right now. Let's see if he's going to be able to hop on here. Hold on. Oh, here he comes. Let's see. Jared. Let's see. Jared, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. I'm just trying to see if I can get video. All right, hold on. Let me see if we can get you on here. There we go. Should work now. Try it again. There you go. Oh! <laughs> oh! There he is. I just set my dogs off barking. All right, Jared, welcome, man. How you doing? Hey, thanks for having me. Good to see you both. Oh, good to whoa, see you this too, is brother. like it's kind of like old times. We were just saying that the last time that we, that, you know, I feel like that we were all together was during the IDA conference in Portland. You both were running that marathon. Now I want to, I, I want to talk about this for a sec because we just segued into overcoming obstacles and growing up with dyslexia, right? I, there's a lot of obstacles that we have to overcome. And I think for our parents watching this, I, I, I want to but we're going we're gonna to dive in on this because for your kids who are struggling with learning and attention challenges, whether it's dyslexia or other reading-based uh, learning, uh, reading learning disabilities, right? Like there's a lot of challenges that we face in the classroom. So as athletes, right, what, what was it like to, to, you know, to overcome some of these obstacles and how did that relate to your journey growing up um, with dyslexia? I'll, I'll let you start. <laughs> I thought you, I'll let you start, Jared. Well, I was, first of all, I just want to say it, I've been able to listen in on a little bit of this conversation. And I, Derek, I heard uh, a good portion of the, the poem you just dropped and I agree with Jake that just chills down your back from listening to those and the words and the importance of expressing that is just huge for us to connect to you, but then also to address the inequity that we're that our education system is facing so i just i'm grateful for your words because so many people can't express it and i think you speak for a lot of people um on a lot of levels so i just appreciate you and i appreciate you both having this conversation absolutely, absolutely. we're gonna dive in a little about that yeah. um as far as like sports go, I mean, the joke that I always said was as long as somebody opened the car door and tied my shoes, I was, I was okay to go play on the soccer field, but getting there was always a challenge. And then I think those fine motor skills um, make it an obstacle for sure. 
uh, to, to playing sports. And I think that's probably where I gravitate towards running because you could just, you know, put on your shoes and go out the door essentially. Um, and then, you know, when you sit in a classroom for eight hours a day, five days a week and not really fit <laughs> and right. struggle through that, a lot of those same emotions can come on a endurance challenge. It's the, it's the same. So it's kind of prepared me for some of those endeavors, whether it was running a treadmill with, with you both in the, in the uh, lobby of- uh, Rich, like, we will be doing in this coming year. I, I'm, we're, we're gonna put our bid in for it. I'm, I'm right. ready for it. All right, <laughs> <laughs> gotta get creative. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's really kind of how I felt. But I, I mean, let Eric, I'll let you kind of tackle it too, because- well, first of all, I didn't, I didn't, okay, because I try, I did maybe one or two seasons of soccer when I was a really little kid, and I was like, I am not good at this at all. So I didn't know that, 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 and um, maybe I wasn't good either. I, I just like to play. I was not good though. No, no. Okay. Yeah, okay. I was a basketball player that couldn't jump. So, uh, <laughs> and I, and I could never, I could never dribble and run at the same time. You know? How would so they I, do that? I, I don't know. It's, it's, yeah, it's I, I was horrible because I would try to do to like, you know, like um, there was a at one point my, my mother had moved to a, a condo development and they had set up like a basketball court and I would, you know, I would try to play and I just I couldn't move. Right. So I would get the ball and I would just shoot no matter where I was. I would get the ball and I would shoot. And then it's like also probably very dyslexic in that I like I could never remember who was on my team and like none of that kind, oh, of, kind of stuff. So I think people kind of quickly realized that if they just said, pass it to me, I was going to pass it to them. And, and then, and, you know, I was this, there. No, this, this was, this was me in, in baseball. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, I, I think that, um, that, you know, for, for me running, again, was a, a, a point where I could experience some excellence and I needed that because I was sort of being beset on all sides, you know, throughout throughout the day. And um, so to be able to go and to hang out with my team was amazing. Um, uh, the, the, the athletes that I ran with were also, you know, from all different corners of the school, right? So, you know, I, I went through the whole day and it was just kids who were, who were on IEPs, you know, we, we were, we were with other students, but there was still a very segregated track that we all moved in. Um, but, you know, I got to make friends with honor students because I was running track and running cross country, right? Like real friendships with like, you know, people I still talk with today. Um, so I think that was important, right? Like it was, it, it allowed for a degree of inclusion um, that, that I, I didn't get in the classroom. And then I, I think that, I know that, um, athletics also teaches a lot of things that, you know, came to play later on in my, in my life. One of which I, I'll just say very plainly is discipline, right? Like distance running is about just putting in the miles, right? Um, and it's a team sport, but it's also something where it's just kind of you and whether you're going to quit or not, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, when I decided I was going to get a degree in math, a lot of that was just sitting at the desk <laughs> and just putting the time in, right, until I could figure out, you know, how to, how to solve an equation. Um, and, and even art, to a certain extent, to a large extent, is the same thing. It's just really about, like, committing the time and having the discipline to do the work. Um, and so I, I think that's, you know, it's, I, it's a skill that I that um, I, I know that I'm still working on. I'm still working on developing, um, but I but I know that it's it's one of the things that carried me through, um, and, and still carries me through now. All right, here's a question. Here's a question for you both because I as a I played team sports also. So I, we all played a team sport, right? That was soccer or basketball or something, right? So I used to play basketball. I started varsity freshman year in high school like I was that was my thing I loved it right but the craziest thing would happen to me and for our parents watching I, I'm I, I there's a there's a connection here to learning challenges okay so just know where we're going we're not just talking sports there's a reason why we're talking sports okay so I'm playing basketball and every year during like January to March like the end the mid to end of the basketball season I would get depressed 
Yeah. I would get sad. I would be for no, without any reason. I was a generally happy guy. I would just be down. And I will never forget, it was on the car ride home from one of my games. My dad was, we were trying to figure it out. It didn't make sense. It always happened every year during this time. And what we learned was that basketball on a court, you're trapped within boundaries. Mm -hmm. You're confined in a box and you can't go out. And as someone with learning and attention challenges in school, I was always confined in boundaries. I, I didn't feel free. And the difference when I would go running is that it would be free. I was, I could go anywhere. I'm, I, I'm running. I was, I was not trapped. Did you find playing team sports that, did you feel that type of, of constraining because of how you grew up with, with dyslexia or did it not, was that maybe just my experience? I'm not sure. <laughs> it may have been just my experience. I, you, you know, when, as you're saying this, I'm, I'm thinking back to my, to myself and, and yeah, I, like I, re, I remember like examples of that, right? Like I remember, I remember be, feeling very free, like in the art room. And then we had a brand new art teacher who showed up and was like, okay, we're going to do an assignment and you can only do, you can only like paint in black wow. and white. And I was like, but I want all the color. And I like had a full meltdown. It was like, who are you to confine me and what my palette's going to be? You know, like, I remember that. Um, I also know that, that like nothing beats cross country. Nothing. You know, like, you know, like I, and I, I ran the half mile, mile, two mile on the track <laughs> and there's a lot of strategy and like how you position yourself in the lane and like, all, and you know, you, you learn all those tricks, right? Um, and so there's like, there's fun there, right? It's like, it's nothing like running across a muddy field oh, and it's 40 I would try to get as dirty and, as possible. <laughs> yeah, you know, and it's like, you know, sometimes you do these races with hundreds of people on the line and, oh. Well, I think if someone beats us in cross country, it's Jared because he ran in Antarctica. So like, I I, I want to, I got to, did right? Is that true? Did you run in Antarctica or am I, am I off? Well, I did, but I mean, who knows? Like, I don't know. Oh, that no, no, we know, Jared. We know. We yeah. know. <laughs> we, we're running we know. Antarctica, okay? Because that's a marathon, mind you. A marathon, not to the cabin to get. I have, I have, I have watched you. I have watched you post your times. We know. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, I, but, Jake, and and Laderek, to the to the point of the the constraint though. Like, I think that's a really great concept because I think as we talk about outlets and like, what is the right outlet for a student or someone that, that needs to get out of that confined space to feel free, the outlet should feel free. It should. For, for and, and I think it depends on the, the individual for sure. I mean, for me, it was anything outside the classroom just felt free. So whether I was in the boundaries of a soccer field or running, loops around a track or a neighborhood or on a treadmill that was all freeing for me I was in a different different space like in my mind you know so that it that worked for me but I don't think that I totally empathize with what you're saying because it doesn't work for everybody and they need those outlets should be the moment where like imagination happens and freedom happens and creativity happens so I, I'm 100% aligned with what you're saying yeah i also i also really benefited from structure you know um and lean, leaned in on it too you know um and it, and there's a degree of freedom that can come from that too i got an immaculate sock drawer right like everything is very very neat you know right um i mean i studied math in in part because it was a very clear path like you know follow these steps and you can solve the problem um but even in that there was something freeing in all of that. And I think it's a great point, right? It's like, it's going to manifest itself differently for all of us, but it's got to feel good. Yeah. And I, and I think as our parents watching, um, and if you have questions for us, please feel free to shut up. I want you to imagine you're looking at the future. If you can look in the future, this is what your kids, this is what your kids are going to become. This is what we're, this is what we're shooting for, right? We're, you know, we're, I'm going to kind of speak on our behalf. We're, were the role models for your kids, right? And if you were to look in the future and ask your kids a question, what do you want to know about uh, from your kids that may not have a voice yet? What would you want to know? I really encourage you to ask away I, I, as we start talking about this because, you know, we were talking about outlets and it, it's something that's so simple. 
It's so simple. All of us have them, but why do we have them? What do they do? What do they provide? Whether they're video games or whether they're, it's, it's what do they provide? And I, what I'm taking from all of us is that this is, it, it gave us, it helped us feel grounded. That, that, that's what I'm, that's really what I'm taking. Yeah. Yeah. I, I say that's fair. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, yeah, that's great. No, I, I, I think the, to, to find cardiovascular exercise and linking that to focus, I, I, I there's a, I mean, I've personally felt that my grades went up significantly from that. And Jared, you, you were going to say something? I, well, I was going to say there, there's, there's scientific evidence to support that, right? Like taking a 10 minute walk in the middle of a day, it can increase productivity by like, I don't know what the, the number is there, but, but that's what the studies show. So it's like that movement throughout the day, it would make sense that that would happen. Right. We just had a question here. Um, Sally asked, how important is exercise to ADHD? I mean, if, I don't, yeah, I don't, I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't have the diagnosis, but everybody I, I know who I has ADHD, ADHD. Am I the only one who has ADHD? I think you may be. Yeah, you okay. might be. Okay, okay. So on behalf of ADHD, I will say that when you are on AD, when you have ADHD, you hyperfocus. And when you hyperfocus, it's it's like a, its own superpower because you can focus on things so intensely that time doesn't exist. And that is a strength, but also could 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 be your arch nemesis also, right? <laughs> because you could be hyper focusing on the wrong thing. What running does, what cardiovascular exercise does, not just exercise like in, in the weight room, because in the weight room, there's a lot of chaos. There's a chaos in the weight room. There's loud, sharp noises. There's people just looking themselves in the mirror, which is distracting, you know, so like <laughs> get in your way. No, but when one is in, I, I, I call it, um, it, it's called over, when you're in overdrive, okay? And when I, what I mean by that is this is your brain. This is your brain when you're on overdrive. <laughs> and what you need to somehow do, it's got to it's do this. Sometimes the way to do that is when you let out your energy through cardiovascular exercise. At least for me, I can speak on behalf of, that's what I need when I'm like this, because it happens still, right? Especially if you take medication, right? It happens. So to go, if, when you run, especially, or any like swimming, but really running, which is the, getting oxygen in your body, it helps ground you and calm you down. Yeah. So. And if I could also say that the other thing, and we're, we're not mentioning, we're not talking about this yet, but I'm, I'm sure it's you know, true for all of us is a lot of us, you know, are also dealing with a lot of trauma from our, from life or, or in particular our experience going through school. And so yeah. there are mental health challenges that come along with that. Right. And there's a, a pretty thick volumes of liter literature, you know, and research out there around, dealing with depression, dealing with anxiety. And those are things that, you know, that many of us are going to wrestle with, whether, no matter how you're labeled. And so there's, there's a lot of benefits to, you know, to, to getting that exercise in and being active. 1000%. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. So to sum up on the exercise, I, th I think we kind of nailed the head on that one. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think there, the other thing I would say to, to weight room and if there's people around, I agree with you, that can totally just be an added chaos environment. If you, if weightlifting happens to be your thing, finding a space where there isn't that going on, that can help, you know, where it's just you in the room or just you and one other person in the room that can you yeah. can get the benefits, but I agree with you. Like running or getting outside is probably the. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so I was, I, a, I, was I was a, when I was going to the gym, you know, like before all this, I was a 6 a.m. guy, you know, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I want to be there as early as possible when there's not a lot of chaos. Yeah. Yeah. I got to minimize the chaos when possible. And a lot of times music is really helpful for that. Um, I want to shift this conversation a little bit to a little bit bigger picture. Okay. Because we, you know, representing the next generation, right? We, we have a responsibility. I say that, I, I said this to you both multiple times. And 
at the end of the day, this is who we're speaking to. We're speaking to our kids. Okay. And we have parents watching this who have the, who, who are the parents of the kids that we speak to. Right. And as you know, you, 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 you very openly talk about the Derek um, and Jared, that there is a lot of inequity in our country when, as it relates to education, access to education. So how do you think, what are some of your visions or ideas and how we can work together as society in the parents, in, in, in the home, outside the home, how can we make special education as, as it relates, especially to, for those with disabilities, right? Um, access, to get access to those, to those types of resources. What are some of your, do you have any ideas on, on ways that we can effectively do that? That's a big question. Okay. I'm ready for it. I'm ready for it. That's, that's a big question for, for, for Monday evening. So um, I'll just, I'll just like kind of rephrasing just some yeah. of what you, what you said there. Um, I, I always look to young people for like the direction. Right. And I, and I come from a lot, like there's wisdom to be found from previous generations, but I also know that so much of the work that we're doing is, a uh, is connected to civil rights issues. Right. So whether we talk about inequities as defined around race, class, um, you know, whether you're a citizen or not, right? Um, or if we're talking about inequities as far as your ability levels, um, you know, whether you've got a diagnosed disability or not, all of this is around like pushing society, right? In a direction towards ever more sort of progressive change, right? So um, when, you, when you become a study of social move, uh, uh, a student of social movements, one of the things that becomes like blaringly clear is that like things really get jumping when young people get involved. You know, like King was in his early twenties when he ran, you know, took, took uh, the lead of the Montgomery bus boycott, right? So like, you know, like I, I, I even in the work that I do in school so often, I, I you know, when it comes to you know, like how to create more inclusive schools, um, you know, um, what can we do to really you know, change the way that um, the, the perception of people with disabilities might be within a school or a school district. Oftentimes I'm like, you need to empower the young people, right? Like the, and, and I think this generation, maybe even more than any other actually has a very strong voice. And I think oh. it's what we saw for most of, of last year and we're still seeing it now, you know, like it was amazing in the George Floyd case to see the emphasis that was put on that very young girl, right? Who stood there and bared witness to what happened to Floyd, right? Like, you know, and the people who were willing to pull out those cameras, so many of those folks, the, the, the footage we really saw was from a very young person. Um, and so I, I think I, I draw a lot of energy and inspiration from young people. Young people, you know, I, I, elementary school, high school, certainly our college students, you know, um, and, for me, so much of this is about investing in them. And then, you know, just another thing is like, I serve on the board, I'm on the, I'm the vice chair for the New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education. And a big part of the work that we do is direct consulting and coaching for educators. Um, so here in, in New Jersey, and then, uh, you know, we're, we're starting to, to talk with uh, communities outside of the state. Um, because the reality is, is that, um, Unfortunately, so many of the educators who we think of as being highly qualified are actually not really well prepared to deal with, educate, or support students that are in any way different than them, right? right. And so whether it be cognitively um, or from a different uh, ethnic background, um, all, all of our, 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 many of our teachers actually need some additional help and additional support. Um, and so, you know, uh, the, the Coalition for Inclusive Education, New Jersey Coalition for Inclusive Education, we do direct coaching, you know, in, in the classroom, you know, working with teachers, working with administrators to say, look, you know, if you could do this, if you, if you, you know, if you provided this support at this time, here's the way that you could, you could create a more inclusive environment so that everyone would be able to benefit. Um, so that, that direct support, um, I, think is, I think is also really important. And our school administrators, you know, like they know this, 
You know, like I think just about anybody who's able, able to take a real honest look at um, our education system and the, the, all the mechanisms we have to prepare teachers know that continual education is essential, right? Like, and not everybody's able to deal with everyone who's in their classroom. Um, but um, that coaching and then also creating a, a schedule that allows for collaboration um, among educators, I think is so key, you know, because I, I, you know, like I know, and thinking back to my own experience of being in school, I was very different for one teacher than I was for another, right? And so much of that had to do with the one that I really showed up for was uh, oftentimes someone who was either teaching to my strengths or communicating to me in a way which really showed me a, de a degree of respect that maybe I didn't get from somebody else. Um, and so, you know, when we, when we, you know, a lot of people toss around, we've got an inclusive, a lot of people say like inclusive classroom. And for the, me, that's really become a red flag, but you know, we've got an inclusive school. A big way to be able to judge whether that's true or not is, you know, to look at, well, where's the spaces where our teachers are allowed to collaborate throughout the day? Because that collaboration, teamwork, I mean, we've been talking about teamwork, you know, like the, that's true for education too. It's not just Right. the sage on the stage right like it's it's an entire team of people collaborating and working together and i and i also think that the student voice has an important role in that as well absolutely i could listen to you talk all day like you just <laughs> i mean you just speak <laughs> yeah I, I, like i don't want it to stop like you just hit so many i mean you hit so many levels of of this and it, um just how important it is. I mean, if if you talked and, and the world listened, we would we'd be in really good shape. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, I just think from the, I look at it from a dyslexic standpoint, as you know, like, and and there is a big inclusivity piece to this to this whole thing. I think, and I really just, I kind of just have these like four things that always come top of mind. And, and that is if we had science-based reading programs from K through third grade, and, and that was across the board. Um, if we, if everyone had the access to assistive technology, we provided extra time for all students, regardless if they're dyslexic or have a learning challenge or not, if we provided extra time for all of them, that I look at it like a marathon race. Like if you had an eight hour course and people need to take seven hours and 59 minutes and 59 seconds to finish and they get their medal, that's awesome. And if someone finishes it in two hours, that's great. But either way, those people are on pace to achievement. And that's, that's really the goal. And then the fourth thing is we need to eliminate GPA and SAT and ACT requirements to participate in extracurricular activities, sports, oh. art, music. If we can do that, I think it it hits some of the notes that you're talking about, Lederick. Like I I think it it can bring equity into our school system. No one would, would no longer have to worry about going outside to get a tutor to provide the right reading instruction. You're no longer, if we can make dyslexia not really a thing from the classroom from the get-go we can eliminate the extra costs that people have to pay right now like you have to get a diagnosis from a doctor but the prescription is education so those are those are fees those are time those are so a single parent that's a that's putting somebody way behind in the race if we can eliminate those doors i think we could do a lot of good for a lot of students whether they're specifically dyslexic or not, or whatever's going on in their life. So that's kind of. Yeah, I agree. I agree a hundred percent, you know, and, and that's the thing too, is the, the line that we draw to determine who's got a disability and who doesn't, who's just like, like, it's very arbitrary. Like, and, and I mean, like, it's something that I think our field really needs to like acknowledge, you know, like if you get one person doing your evaluation on one day, like you can get a different diagnosis. Right. And oh. so the reality is, is that human ability exists on a continuum and all of us fall in different places and you know all, all of us need help right and and we'll use some of the same supports and i and i again i think that's part of the culture of inclusion that all of our schools need to adopt that 
you know, and I say it in the poem, like it's, you know, it's, the, it's, 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 there's no shame involved in asking for help. It's actually a sign that like, yo, I'm trying to figure this out and we should all be given the tools and right. they should be normalized, not stigmatized. Ooh, Ooh I like that. Is that, is that a next is that a next poem no, that's coming out no, right now not. no you're sure just... <laughs> <laughs> does it just come out does it just come out naturally for you like do you can you just drop those like <laughs> i'm just gonna drink my water <laughs> so i i'm a big believer in neurodiversity but also neuroequality you know equality is such a big word now but on top of just other types of diversities, right? You have the way we learn. Because in the classroom, that's a huge factor. And I think on top of all of, of, of what you both are saying, which I am so beyond on board with, Martin Luther King, who okay, you were just talking about King, actually King inspired me in ways he actually, learning about him was the reason why I'm in this field, actually. Um, it was, and I've said this before in some of my other shows, the, the letter from Birmingham jail. And here you have a guy in jail in Birmingham, Alabama, that somehow wrote a letter to the white clergy and, and, in such a powerful way to not only get them to want to read it, but to then act. And this is a black man in jail. They didn't have to do anything but they did, that's, that's power. And what I learned from that was that if you can communicate powerfully, you can communicate to those who don't understand you. And to have the confidence to, to be able to do it or to know how to do it, how, how to take words and, and, to, and to be able to call someone that doesn't understand you a brother, right? Like, like that takes strength because they were the ones that put you in jail in the first place. And this is the, physically, but also metaphorically, we can use jail in terms of your own jail, right? So we can take, you use many words for jail and imprisonment, right? But I, I, I think if we can bring communication strategies into the classroom, because that's something that doesn't cost a lot of money. It doesn't cost much to change what comes out of your mouth, right? That's, that's your own ability to do it, right? You, to, 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 to tell someone you're not going to go to college because of your disability, which that was said to me, right? You, that person could have controlled those words, right? So I, I think if we can bring all the above, but also this new way of we can bring structured literacy into the classroom. We can bring, we can bring assistive technology into the classroom, but at the end of the day, it's still up to the student to want to use it or to want to learn it. So to find ways in the classroom that we can create the willingness to learn, right? To identify all of our unique strengths and that just because you have dyslexia or just because you have ADHD or just because of whatever background you come from, does it make you less than? It's just, it, it could become just part of the label. Like for me, I was always told math will always be my life's biggest challenge. So guess what happened? I never actually learned math until a few years ago. Because I always told myself that math is gonna be my problem. That, that, that's it, I'm just not good at it. Fumiko Haft, who is a world renowned neuro researcher in, this, in the field did, is doing a study on this. And to, I forget specifically what the name of the study is. However, it, generally what, it, what it's about is taking labels and measuring how labels impact performance. How if you're told something, does that become a reality? Almost like a self-fulfilling prophecy. And it, it does happen. Like at the IDA conference, we see, we, I, I can't tell you the amount of kids I heard at the conference said that I can't read because of my dyslexia. And I asked them, I'm like, can you actually not read or is it just really challenging? Because there's a huge difference, you know? So, and again, that's what comes out of our mouth. We tell it to ourselves, it becomes a reality. 
So I, I think if we're able to, to, to we, weave that in to a curriculum, I think that's something that could be really powerful as well. Yeah. And I'm a big fan of Flamiko's work. She's, she's done. Uh, she's incredible. Our, yeah. She's done our field tre tremendous justice. And I, I think um, that, that aspect of it that you're talking about is she's, she's, um, she's looking at stereotype threat. Right. That's, that's what it is. Right. Yeah. And that's a concept that I, um, uh, that I was first introduced to like within the, the concepts of like black identity and, you know, and for folks who don't know it, like stereotype threat is, it's, it's this interesting phenomenon that if you present somebody with a, with a stereo, a stereotype, it tends to l limit their ability in some kind of way. Right. So they've done studies where it's like, um, you know, if a teacher shows up and says, you know, something to the akin or even slightly like, you know, black students aren't good at math and it gives them a math test. Those kids tend to perform poor, you know, and then if it's like, you know, a black guy shows up in a white gym class and says something to the effect of like, white guys can't jump, all of a sudden they can't jump, right? And so like- Well, I actually couldn't jump, so. Right, well, well, but there, but there's, you know, there's this, and, and I remember seeing that and being like, well, okay, well, if I'm told I have a learning disability, like I can't learn, you know, then I, does that start working away even on a subconscious level to, to where I'm not able to perform as well in school? Um, yeah, I mean, and again, I think so much of that speaks to culture, right? Speaks to the, to, to the culture and what the, what the standards are and, you know, and, and what we expect of people um, and what we assume of people um, to, you know, and, and that, that culture change, so much of that is, I mean, that's, that's the hard work. That's like the, you know, and hopefully conversations like ours and people who are, who are listening in and asking questions and gonna share this and, and what have you, um, part, part, of, part of what our nation is in desperate need of is a, is a lot of challenging conversations that are going to challenge our culture um, and, and, and look very deeply into places where, you know, in some cases we should be ashamed of, right? Like, I'm just wait, like, I'm just waiting for the kid who's in special ed, who's forced to go to, to a classroom in the basement every day, who goes to and from school in a, in a short bus to just put a camera on all of that, you know? Yeah and and show it for for the inequity that it that it is um right because i don't think you know like and that's just that's little that's not even like being you know bust out of your district you know to some other building that could be you know like a a, a really segregated setting you know right. really restricted setting um but yeah that, i mean there's 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 so much work to be done and i i, I appreciate the letter from a birmingham jail callback um that was oh, yeah it's one so, of, i really encourage you, every all, American uh, needs everyone, to read that. Everyone needs to listen. Everyone needs to read it, to listen to it, and to dissect it because you're going to read it once and you're going to feel something. You're going to read it again and you're going to start to see what he's doing. And then you're going to read it a third time. And you're going to be like, wow, that is pure genius. Yeah. Pure genius. And, and for me, what stood out in that letter is the, it's the, um, the, commentary to his colleagues that number one like you know like who are you to say that we're not that we we should be slowing down right like not moving this this fight forward and then also like silence is not acceptable you know and that was that is some of the the arguments that i've had with uh with peers and colleagues over the past 12 months that you know some of the social issues that have come up um we all again we all need to be pulling right? Like this is everybody's fight. We all need to be involved. It's the greatest lesson for our kids. It's up to, uh, it's up to the, the adults. Have, we have, we have the, the, the ability to bring the change. The kids right now are the recipients, but it's the greatest lesson to our kids because the only way change will come is when we go through something uncomfortable. That's the only way, the only way you got to peel the bandaid off. If you want to get better and stronger, you tear your muscles. That's how you build muscles. You want to get better at something. You got to go through the uncomfortable to then find the success. And that is, we're on the brink of stepping into, we're already un, in uncomfortable. And I feel, i actually feel confident that the, our education system is, it, it, it's time. COVID was a, the, the 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 whole quarantine was I, I I think a silver the silver lining was that we're for the first time parents got a chance to see their kids not before and after but during 
They saw it with their own eyes. And they're like, we're, we're the voters. Kids don't vote. We vote. And that's the only way we're going to bring the change. You know? Ah. <laughs> but Let's go. <laughs> I, think, I think you hit on uh, communication is such a key, key note to this whole thing, right? That's what's going to make it go. And at the end of the day, like what we're talking about is human rights when it comes to education, when it comes to the ability to read. And it's a human right. Oof. And, and Jake, you hit on it earlier, but it is, it's a responsibility. Like it's, you know, to, to dial in, to, to dial into the youth, to what their needs are, to where they're at. And then I love what you said, but they're like you taking that energy and being, because that's what, that's what can pull this thing together. I think. Yeah. All right, Jill Biden, if you're listening to this, we want to come <laughs> We're ready. We're ready to talk. We're ready to talk because I look. I, I'm sick and tired of 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 all adult board members that are that are people that are past the age of sixty that have not been in education for for like over half of their life. We need kids in these boards. We need the gen. We I would love to see representatives of middle school and high school in some of these high level positions as volunteers but to be those those the voice from with from inside with no politics in mind other than just this is what i'm experiencing imagine that kid that you talked about Lou Derek, on the short bus being taken out of the classroom being made fun of being forced to read out loud in front of their peers having a voice up top you know i i i think it, it's a combination of humility but also an, an openness to, to, to look at those who actually are in it now. Yeah, we all deserve a seat at the table. Yeah, yeah we all do. Yeah, okay, so Joe, that you're watching this, I just wanna, again, acknowledge that we're very excited for the invitation. I know time hasn't caught up to it yet, but I know it's coming. So um, again, if anyone watching this that can help us get to her, we're, we're, ready, we're ready to talk. We're ready to talk because that's, I'm, this is our year. We got four years to make this happen. It's going to happen. We will bring the change in these four years. I'm, I'm telling you, we just got to keep pushing. We got to, we got to keep pushing. <laughs> well, I, I appreciate you putting us out like that. I, 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 and I would just add that I, I have been really impressed with the, the level of diversity within this administration um, that it, it, is was amazing from go from you know the the campaign particularly the inauguration you know from you know we we saw sign language you know we had a, a black female spoken word oh um you know yeah. poet at the inauguration who had had you know speech and language issues we got a president who's been open about his experience of stuttering you know and, and we got a, we got a a uh, a black and you know indian vice president i mean it's i don't know man it's it's the year I, it's the year of the forgotten child that's what i'm that's i i stay very optimistic you know yeah. like and i i have to force myself to you know but like i'm um you know i i i know that in some ways like the world has sort of stepped back a few paces um but i i you know i i still 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 stay very optimistic for the the future yet to come mm. jared you got anything for us well i was just curious i, I agree with everything uh, you both have just said but i was curious if anyone's run a marathon within the white house yeah oh. the first lady she did it yeah i'm pretty sure she's a marathon i think she's no she no no that. no sorry i meant like with the oh, treadmill in the white house i'm I, <laughs> oh <laughs> Chill. Okay. So now we're not only going to meet you, but we're going to run a marathon in, in the White House. I like to do it in the Oval Office while we do the interview. Come on. <laughs> y'all are, y'all are too much. Okay. <laughs> I mean, that, I was, as you were talking and you're talking about how progressive this administration has been, I was like, well, have we really pushed it? We really push it one notch right there. You know, and, and, and I think looking at our generation, looking at what's happening right now in our country, like there is no such thing as limits anymore. We are, we're ready to, I think it's, it's really time for 
those who have been misunderstood and just put down to rise up and to, to, to find that voice. And that's only going to come again by people like us, by people like the, like the both of you who are out there and spreading this message of let's stand up. And for those of you watching who have kids that are struggling, have them watch this interview. Have them know that each and every one of us struggled in our own respective ways and were the forgotten child in school once, but have found our voice and are speaking about it. And that's, that's why we're here so that your kids can feel confident to know that they're not alone. They're not alone. They're not. Seriously. And you as parents are not alone. I know it sometimes feels lonely. I know it feels that you, you don't see that path at the end of the tunnel. That, that, not the path, but the light. But just know with every hurricane, the sun's always shining on top. So we're going to get through this together. Um, and with that, I want to ask you both one last question. Um, what would you say, um, what would you say is your superpower? I'll let you go later. You take the lead on it. <laughs> While you think about it, I just want to tell everyone that it's my birthday tomorrow. So like, oh. I, just, I, I just want to take, I, I want all the attention as I can get. Right? No, I'm just joking. But it actually well, ha happy, happy early and, birthday. And this is my, the best way I can celebrate coming into my birthday is with both of you. So, um, I don't know. I think I have a lot of. I, well, I don't think I know. I have a lot of talents. You know, um, I don't. I don't always. I don't necessarily look at it as a as a superpower. Um, you know what I will say is. Um, you know, in addition to uh, King's work, uh, people should read Joseph Campbell's work, right? And Joseph Campbell did a lot of studying around mythology and the role that mythology and storytelling has in our in our in our culture and our lives. And um, reading his work really helped me to appreciate the hero's journey, right? And so, you know, one of the you know, and sort of like flipping this a little is, you know, I I uh, I think of myself as being the hero in my own story. And I think that all, you know, mm. particularly our young people coming up, you know, regardless of whether you see yourself as having a, a superpower or not, um, you know, the, the, the hero is oftentimes someone who begins the story feeling very powerless and goes through a lot of adversity and, you know, and it sometimes finds that wise teacher, you know, or that, that, crew of people that says, okay, let's go on this quest and this journey together. Um, and uh, I, I think that the magic of life and all the people, many of the people who I admire the most are the ones who, you know, were bold enough to say, uh, I'm going to take control of my own narrative, right? And I'm going to, I'm going to write a story for myself that is my life that maybe is very, very different than what the world has set out. Um, and if I, maybe if, maybe that's it, right? Like whether it be the, the breakdown I had when I was nine, when I was 17, you know, when I was dealing with all this insecurity and, and misunderstanding about what it meant to be LD and what my future was, you know, I used that, turned that into an opportunity to rebuild and refocus and redefine myself. And it's like, all right, now I'm going to college. And, you know, throughout my entire life, I think I have, I have never wasted I've never wasted a crisis, right? I've always used it as an opportunity to grow. And, uh, and that's like my little cocoon that a better version of myself emerges from. All right, Jared. I don't know how you can, I mean, everyone has their own respective abilities that, that, that that's what makes neurodiversity amazing is that really thank you for sharing that with Derek. All right, Jared. Yeah, that's huge. I, uh, just on that note, Lederic, I super powerful uh, what you're talking about, and 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 I I love the concept of hero's journey. Like that, just it, it translates really well. Jake, happy birthday! I wish you the best tomorrow and a great day. Uh, I think for me, and I don't know if it's a superpower, but I think something that has come out of this experience is just. And it's really one word I, I, I gravitate towards, and that's grit. Um, and that has just 
it's been the thing that has stayed with me uh, for a longer, like the duration, whether it's an endurance challenge or whether it's a challenge in the classroom, it's just that want to. And so that's really like, that's really been the thing that keeps coming to mind when we talk about and I don't know if it's a superpower or whether it's a result <laughs> of, of this experience of, of dyslexia, um, but the word grit is what I would say. Mm. And I think for the parents or the students or educators listening, my message would be where you start or where it started is not where you're gonna be finishing. And for educators, it's really important to give your students grace and let them evolve, let them mature, let them grow, and don't stifle it with what your current evaluation is of them right now, because that can limit them, that can put them in the box that we've been talking about, that can put them in a constrained environment and if we can hold judgment and allow this process to unfold, I think that can, there isn't limits. So that'd just be my one thing for the people listening. Wow. This is great. This is great. I, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I really am speechless on all, on all, on all fronts because it's just the truth, you know? Um, Lederic, do you have any thoughts for, for everyone that you'd like to leave our parents and educators with that are watching? Um, just, um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a good time connecting with any, everyone. Um, you know, if you want to reach out, you can, my website is just Lederic.com, just my first name.com. And um, on all the social media, you know, feel free to reach out. And it's always just my name, nothing like super cryptic. Um, so just search, search my name. Um, and, uh, you know, and if I can be of service in any way, please let me know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Jared, I know you wrote a book. I know we didn't really talk about it, but Running the Distance. Um, where can people get the book? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's being sold through the International Dyslexia Association. Um, it's on their website. Uh, I believe Shop ID IDA is the is their platform. So, but if you go on their website, you'd be able to find it. And then all the sale proceeds are going back to the International Dyslexia Association as a fundraiser to just try and find ways to give back. That's so amazing. That's awesome. Can I can I put in a plug too? Um, so uh, we've all we're, we're all connected to uh, Nancy and the folks at the Rare yes. Gym Talent School in Kenya. Um, so I, my, I, on my Instagram account, the, um, the website that's connected to that account at the top of the account is a, a, a um, global giving campaign where they're raising funds to, uh, to expand the school. They've made it through COVID, but they still need a lot of our help. So um, if anybody wants to jump over to, to Instagram um, or if you search uh, the Rare Gym Talent School on the global giving site, it should come up. But the, the direct link is right there in the, the For those of you that may not know about the Rare Gym Talent School, Nancy built one of the only dyslexia schools that are certified in Gillingham in all of Africa. And she has been running this school, 170 students in an abandoned motel with two working bath, two computers that are from the 1990s and I think one or two working bathrooms, barely. And these are kids from all over the country that in, in Kenya uh, that are that that are coming to to get this type of special education. So it, it is it, she's an incredible woman. Um, and I, I've said this before about talking about this is that we in America have we have all the resources, but bad politicians over there, they have no resources and no politicians. So like, it's time for, you know, we have a responsibility being in a, a country like America that we can support, you know, this is a global thing, dyslexia. It's not just in America. 
Um, so I really recommend supporting that school um, at all costs. Um, and yeah, so I'll make sure we put your information down um, in the links. Um, and if you are also interested in learning about how to connect your kids to their very own mentor who also has dyslexia or ADHD um, anywhere in the world, uh, just please let me know. It's called Superpower Consulting. You can find our Facebook Superpower Mentorship um, and we'll be happy to give you a discount. Um, we are dedicated to helping kids find their voice, um, not just in America, but anywhere in the world that has learning attention challenge um, to go out there and make a difference. So this was, yeah, go ahead, Jeremy. Um, really quick for the people that, uh, are looking to donate to the Rare Gem, Nancy was teaching everyone how to make masks during COVID like literally cloth mask out of t-shirts. Like this is the woman that to, to Jake's point and Derek's point is, is doing everything for this community. So, so anyway, we can support her. Yeah. It would be. And I, I don't know if you guys have seen it, but they've broken ground on a brand new school. They're starting to put the infrastructure in. The goal is to try to build it up to, you know, support 500 students and to just be a beacon in that part of the, of the, of the continent. Um, so yeah, if any support you can provide will go a long way. Okay, so Rare Gym Talent School. And, and I'll, I'll send you the direct link so you done, can put it in the comments. We'll post it in the, in, the, in the group here. Well, everyone, thank you so much for joining us. Um, and this has been so much fun again. And I just, you know, we got to have this back on again because you two are, this was, there's so much energy here. Um, so yeah, really, thanks again for joining us. Um, and really quick, one last thing is that we are on Thursday at 11 o'clock um, launching a, a free parent info session about mentoring. Uh, so if you'd like to learn more about that, you can just follow, just, it's on our Facebook page. Um, and we are just excited to meet you and to continue these conversations. So everyone have a great night uh, and um, see you next time. Thank you, Jake. Take care. Bye.